webinar for newcomers uh, coming to Canada on buying a home in Canada as a newcomer. Uh, my name is Clem Le Beauvalier. I am head of Arrive, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by two experts that are going to be uh, helping us uh, learn all about this really uh, important subject, uh, Lahiru and Lee. So I would love for you uh, both to introduce yourselves to our audience this morning. Go ahead, Lahiru. Hi, thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Lahiru, and I'm a mortgage specialist for RBC. I've been with the World Bank for over 11 years now. I'm not sure if my uh, camera quality is that great, but when I started, my hair was jet black. <laughs> um, thank you, Lee. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Lee Koo. I am a realtor in based in Toronto. I just wanted to share that as a part of the newcomer journey, my parents, I'm Chinese, but my parents are from India. So as immigrants who came to Canada, I know very well how important it is to be able to purchase that home to ground yourself when you come to Canada. So that's why arrive in is, is so important. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, well, thank you both for uh, joining us today. Uh, we're really uh, looking forward to leaning into all of your expertise uh, to unpack this topic. So um, in this webinar, we're going to be covering uh, the following things over the course of the next hour or so. First of all, we're going to talk about uh, determining your home buying parameters. And what we mean by that is uh, determining where in Canada you um, it makes sense for you to be buying a home. And understanding the types of homes uh, that are available out there uh, so that you can kind of hone in and, and determine uh, what it is that uh, you're in the market for. Um, then I'll tear it over to uh, Lihiro and he'll tell us all about the financing aspect of your home, how mortgages work, getting pre-approved for mortgage, down payments, other costs um, that as a home buyer you need to be factoring into your budget. And then Lee, of course, who's our uh, real estate expert here, uh, will walk us through all about the actual process of uh, visiting, searching, um, uh, uh, and actually making an offer and closing uh, on a property that you're going to buy. So uh, we've got a lot to cover uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, so please sit tight. Uh, do use the uh, chat feature that is on the side of your screen here if you have questions as we go. We've got the amazing um, film uh, on uh, deck to answer as many of your questions as possible, and, and we'll be able to answer them as well as we go. Um, just before we do begin, though, I want to say this webinar is being recorded, and we will share the recording with you, um, all who are um, joining us today after the fact. Um, and also, this webinar is brought to you by Arrive, uh, which is your one-stop shop for all of the free newcomer resources uh, that you need to help prepare for your move uh, and adapt to life in Canada. And that includes um, guides, tools, hundreds of articles, videos, webinars, much like this one, on topics like finding a job or uh, the daily logistics of life in Canada, uh, banking, um, studying in Canada, if you're coming as an international student as well, you can find it all on arrivein.com. And I would like to say that Arrive uh, is fully funded and operated by the Royal Bank of Canada. Um, which is really, it's the biggest bank in Canada and it is a, um, a banking partner of choice for newcomers. Um, so they fund this because they really believe in helping newcomers thrive um, when they uh, begin their new life here in Canada. Um, so that being said, let's talk a little bit about uh, determining your home buying parameters. So first questions that many, many newcomers ask is, can they even buy a home in Canada? Who can buy a home in Canada? Um, so let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, permanent residents and their spouses can buy residential property uh, in Canada. Um, and that is absolutely um, uh, no, no rules or restrictions around that. Um, if you are not yet a permanent resident, or uh, if you're a temporary resident, there's um, uh, uh, there's a law called the Prohibition Act on the Purchase of Residential Property by Non-Canadians. Um, and that complicates things a little bit. Uh, what that means is that temporary residents like work permit holders and study permit holders may be eligible for an exemption from this act. Um, and essentially, uh, it will depend on uh, some things like whether or not uh, 
you uh, have longer term status in Canada. So um, some banks will help you fund uh, your, um, your home purchase, uh, even if you're a temporary resident, but you may be required to have a lawyer or a notary confirm this before you're eligible for a mortgage. Um, some newcomers are able to purchase a home right away upon arrival in Canada, and some may need to save up for a few years to secure a down payment uh, before they can buy a home in Canada. So there are a lot of different cases here. Um, really, it will come down to your specific situation, what your status is, uh, even if you are a temporary resident, do you have a stable income uh, from abroad? Do you have stable income and a stable job here in Canada? Uh, how long have you been here? Uh, so it all of these things will factor in. Um, typically, uh, how soon you can get a mortgage will also depend on your specific situation. Um, and is this approach will vary per banking institution. Uh, today, we have a specialist from RBC who can really speak to what RBC offers. Uh, but obviously, different financial institutions that offer mortgages might have different rules around this as well. Um, with RBC, you might be eligible for a mortgage right away, um, or you might have to build up your Canadian credit history, depending on your situation. If you have foreign income from certain specific countries that might be able to be taken into account as a way to repay your mortgage. So um, that is something that could play in your favor to be eligible for a mortgage right away. Or if you have stable Canadian employment and income here in Canada, even if you haven't been here for very long, that might also play in your favor in terms of being able uh, to uh, be eligible for a mortgage right away. Um, so whether you're going to be able to buy a home right away or whether you need to wait a few months or years to save for that down payment, it's never too early to learn about the home buying process in Canada uh, to make sure that you are able to have a plan in place to get you there. Uh, so that's why we're going to go into this, whether this is your situation uh, right now that you're in the market for home or whether you may want to wait for a few years. This is still a really good uh, use of your time if down the line you are planning on buying a home in Canada at some point. So um, the first thing that we're going to talk about here is uh, deciding on a city or neighborhood. And obviously, if you're new to Canada, um, you're perhaps not fully familiar with the differences between the different cities, different neighborhoods, um, and, and everything that's involved uh, in that. So that'll probably be your first place to start. Um, deciding and comparing the price of homes, which are very different from one city to another, sometimes from even one neighborhood to another. Uh, but in addition to the price of home, the cost of living could also be vastly different. And obviously, uh, the budget that you have or the income that you'll be earning may go further in some places than others. So it's a really good idea to have an, a strong sense of um, what the cost of living is like in a given location, what the job market is like as well, because um, in some places where real estate and properties may be more affordable, there may also be fewer jobs available. So a um, good idea to factor that in as well. And also the type of lifestyle that a given city offers. Uh, obviously, living, living in Vancouver is vastly different from living in Edmonton, which is vastly different from living in Montreal or Halifax or Toronto. So um, all of these places have vastly different lifestyles. And it's a good idea to learn about what living like is there to see if it's going to be something that you're going to love or something that maybe is not for you. Um, and so once you've decided on a city, it's also a good idea to narrow down uh, on a neighborhood um, look at what types of homes exist in certain neighborhoods. It might be high rise buildings and condos. Other neighborhoods might have um, more low rise houses with backyards, um, lots of different lifestyles from one neighborhood to the next, different budgets, obviously, as well, and then different availability as well. Some neighborhoods might have more homes that are for sale uh, than others. Um, as you're narrowing down a neighborhood, you'll also want to factor in commute time to city center if that's where you think you'll be working. Um, walk and transit scores. Um, will living in this type of neighborhood mean that you will need to have a private vehicle or will you be able to rely on public transit? Obviously, that's an additional cost. Uh, to factor in, and it's also an additional um, uh, time of, uh, of available working hours that you may or may not be spending in commute. So um, good to, to factor that in. And then factoring in also proximity to schools, to your future workplace, to grocery stores, 
malls, places of worship, all of these places that you will be uh, going to on a regular basis, how accessible are they from the neighborhoods that you're considering? Um, so with all of these things, um, that should help you decide on a, on a neighborhood. Um, and we recommend as you're looking at the budgeting portion, you can use Arrive's free cost of living calculator um, that we're sharing a link to right now. And uh, that will uh, give you an estimate of what the cost of life is like uh, in a given city. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lee here to tell us a little bit about the types of homes that you find in Canada. And I think it's important to um, understand that uh, very different types of homes uh, might exist or might not really be something that's um, readily available in your home country to understand um, the terminology that you will encounter as you're doing your home search. Yeah, thanks so much. We're just going to go over this really quickly because your price point is probably going to determine what you can afford. Most For most people, that'll likely be a condo. Condos and apartments are terms that are, are used interchangeably. Um, because they are tall, like, you know, a unit that's inside a tall building, a high rise or a low rise. Apartments are typically older units. Um, and especially for when it's rental properties, it's it's like purpose built rentals. Uh, but a condo is typically individually owned. But for the purpose of this conversation about purchasing a home, um, often people refer to apartments and condos interchangeably. So that's one piece. That's likely what most people will enter the market to, to buy in Toronto. A townhouse, um, you can see there's a picture of a detached house, which is a home where all four sides of it is yours, whereas a semi-detached would be sharing one wall and a townhouse house would, it, they're, they're usually a little bit smaller, right? So they are kind of like, houses that are next to each other with both walls shared. So if you think about the hierarchy, um, you'd have a condo, which is multiple units in one building. You have a um, townhouse, which has one on each side of you, a semi, you only share one wall and a detached house. That whole property is yours. So that's just the clarification of the types of homes. Thank you very much. Um, can we talk a little bit about pre-construction homes versus resale homes? This is also two vastly different things. Definitely. This is super important. We have very limited time, but I'm going to go over high level. A pre-construction home is typically something that hasn't been built. It's before construction occurs. So when you're buying a pre-construction home, usually you'll put, um, you know, five, 10, however much thousand dollars down to say, look, I'm interested. So I'm going to hold my spot. And then over a certain period of time, um, you know, sometimes they do an increments like, okay, you put your deposit down of like $5,000 just to hold your spot. But then in 30 days or in three months and six months or in a year, you're going to have to add more money, right? And that will be spelled out what you will add. The benefit of this is that you can purchase it at a lower price. The challenge, of course, is when will it get built because shovels haven't hit the ground right because builders need to be able to secure enough money to get the funds to help pay for the construction now one thing to be mindful of um, a pre-construction home may be great for someone who is a little bit flexible with timing when COVID happened a lot of pre-construction homes were stalled and delayed um, so that's a whole other other piece there. Mm -hmm. Typically for people who are like, I need to move in a month, a real sale home will be your best choice. Or I definitely want need to be having my own home in two or three months. A resale home is a home that is already built. You can typically go in with your realtor to look at it and you can negotiate, hey, I'm going to buy this and I'm going to take possession of this within 45 days of me putting in this offer. So there's more security and you actually see what has been built and where things are. Whereas with the pre-construction, you see drawings and drawings are subject to change. And really, it's something to be aware of because you don't actually see a real, you don't enter the space and really see it. And, and Builders have the opportunity to change things around as they need to accommodate building specs. So that's a high level piece there. Happy to talk more about it because there's always more. 
Thank you. Um, we'll we'll uh, come back to you in a little bit because you have a lot of expertise in the in the visiting and, and uh, exploring uh, aspect of the process. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the financing aspect, which is really crucial uh, to the home buying experience. So Lahir, I'm going to turn it over to you a little bit to tell us about mortgages. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the concept of mortgages, but they might work a little differently in Canada from your home country. So to that effect, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Uh, and bear with us if you're already familiar with some of it. There may be some things that are new to you nonetheless. Perfect. Thank you. So yes, so name is Lahiru. I am the mortgage specialist from RBC. So I'm going to be guiding everybody very, very quickly about the buying process. I'll talk a little bit about some things that are really important in this process, like, you know, how to save for a down payment, a down payment themselves, um, and a little more about the pre-approval process and other costs that you should be aware of. So in the whole process, if you forget any of my information, you can always reach out to me. It doesn't matter where you're going in the country. You can always reach out to me for a question. No problem. Okay. And we'll so, be sharing the hero's contact information for that. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So homes in Canada are obviously very expensive. So for that reason, majority of Canadians, majority of people who come to Canada, they have loans against their home, which we call a mortgage, right? So uh, uh, there's types of different mortgages and, and, and each bank kind of tailors their own, but on a very high level, they essentially have very few key uh, steps. Main things are you can amortize or the total length of your mortgage can be up to 25 or 30 years, depending on how much you put as your down payment. I'll go about that in a little bit more detail. And then those 30 years are then broken down into shorter five-year, three-year, maybe even a four-year term. Now, why do we break that 30 years into a shorter 30, uh, five years? It's because mainly because people in Canada don't stay in their homes forever. You know, those ancestral homes from back home, we don't really have that concept as much. So almost every five years, people tend to move. So to give that kind of flexibility, there are shorter terms, okay? Um, that's basically the, the main concept of it. I'm gonna go a little bit more detail. So people always ask, how much money do I need to come up with? How much money do I need as my down payment? It's all dependent on how much, obviously, how much you can afford, but also your price point. So if you look at this image on the right-hand side, on the first 500000 of the purchase price, it's 5%. That's the minimum guideline in Canada, 5% under 500000 If your purchase price is a little over 500000 but below $1 million, it's then 10%, 5 5% 5 on the first 500,000 and then 10% on the remainder, okay? And then if your purchase is over a million, now it doesn't matter if you're a first time buyer, a second time buyer, an investor, over 1 million, the, the down payment is 20%, 20%, okay? And these down payment guidelines apply all across the country, not just one province, all across the country. So I'm going to guide your eyes to the right-hand side. If your purchase price, let's say 700000 the minimum down payment is 25000 for the first 500000 Okay. Then from uh, five hundred to 700000 is 200000 That's 10%. That's $20,000 right there. And that's total $45,000. So you need $45,000 minimum for a home price of $700,000. Okay. Now I'm going to guide your eyes again to the uh, bottom left. What can we use as down payment? Okay. 
we can obviously use your own money, your own savings, your own investments, all right? They must be in your own accounts for three months, three months. It's a very important uh, rule that we have in Canada. You cannot have your money uh, for a month or so. It must be there for three months, okay? That's the first thing. Second is once you're in Canada, there's something called a retirement savings plan and you can take out $35,000 from that account. Very popular, but the concept might be a little unfamiliar right now, but once you're in Canada, we'll give you a lot more information about it. And then the third down payment option are gifts from your immediate family or family that is hands reach. Like for example, your parents, a sibling, a close cousin, right? Um, those we can take, of course, even if your, your family is back home, we can still accept that, all right? What can we not use? We can't use borrowed money, essentially. We can't use unsecured lines of credit. We can't use uh, personal loans. We can't use credit cards. We cannot borrow money from your friends either, right? Gifts from your family are okay, but they must be gifts. It cannot be a term for a loan, all right? If you have specific questions about these, you can always let me know because there's every situation is different and every, you know, every mortgage is, is it has its own fine little fingerprint. So uh, we can talk about that in more detail. Absolutely. And right now we're sharing um, a, a link to be able to find a mortgage specialist like the hero um, close to you. Highly encourage you to connect with a mortgage specialist who can talk to you about your specific situation because everyone's situation is different, obviously. Uh, we'll be sharing the hero's details specifically if you have questions for him. But uh, if you are moving to a different part of the country uh, uh, that is not the greater Toronto area and, and want to find a mortgage specialist closer to you, please use that link and kind of um, have conversations that will enable you to understand what applies to your specific situation. Okay. Uh, so with that, let's talk a little bit about how mortgages work. Um, and yes. you, you touched on this, but let's go yeah. into a little more detail so here. I touched on the amortization or the total length of the mortgage. Okay. Now, the total length of the mortgage also is dependent on how much money you put as your down payment. If you put less than 20% as your down payment, your mortgage is essentially government insured. And there are some restrictions like the total length can only be 25 years. If you want the government out of the equation, you must put 20%. Okay. At 20%, you go up to 30 years. 30 years is obviously a little bit better because the monthly payments are lower, okay? And then, of course, like I talked about earlier, there are mortgage terms. We have fixed terms and variable terms. A fixed term, you can think of it like a, a fixed deposit. It's consistent. It's the same throughout your agreed year number of years, four years, five years, whatever you initially agreed to. And then the variable, it changes with the market, but it's the Bank of Canada that ultimately decides how, what your, you know, your overnight lending, your variable rate will be, okay? Um, I'm going to guide your eyes to the bottom hand corner. Um, these are some really important topics, three things I'm going to talk about. Is your Canadian credit score, okay? Everybody talks about having Canadian experience. And everybody also now talks about having Canadian Credit Bureau. So on a high level, your score must be above 680 to easily qualify. Above 680, we like, okay? How do you maintain a score of 680 or more? Okay. And also as a newcomer, how do you even get there? Because as a newcomer, usually, you're starting from scratch because yeah. in most cases, uh, your credit history from your home country won't really carry over in Canada. Um, yes. So yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. So, so everybody who comes over will start off with a certain number. 
Okay. Now, uh, how to maintain that 680 or more is a few things. Okay. When you come to the country, I highly recommend you open two things because at a minimum, we look for two different trades on your credit bureau. First is easiest thing is a phone bill. Okay. You need a cell phone plan anyway. You may as well go to the uh, three big companies that are in, in the country, uh, which are Rogers, Telus, and Bell. Uh, and then those that will report on your credit bureau as a credit item. So first is a phone bill. Second is you can go to the bank and apply for a newcomer credit card. Okay. Limit will maybe be $1,000, maybe $2,000 maybe 2,500, depending on how you're coming. But those are two very easy ways, almost guaranteed ways of starting your Canadian credit, okay? Then you have to maintain it. The way you maintain it is you only use, at the very beginning, less than 50% of, of your available credit. So if your limit is $2,000, only go up to $1,000. That'll really help you bring up your credit score. Yeah, and I'm just going to jump in here and say that um, Arrive has a lot of resources on uh, building your credit. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of our uh, time today on that. If this is something that's very new concept to you, please go and look at some of the resources, the articles and guides and webinars that we have on our website for this. It's a really important concept, uh, but important. I don't want to take it because we've got so much to get through today. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do also want to mention, Lahiro, you can tell us a little more about this. RBC does offer uh, mortgages to newcomers, even if without a credit score under certain circumstances. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about what um, that's about? Yeah. So we have, a, we have multiple programs for newcomers. First is a standard program where, you know, you can put as little as 5% down, 10% down. And then there are programs where you can put down 35% as your down payment, where we don't really uh, uh, look too much into your credit so much, okay? But we will take into consideration some sort of employment that you had from back home. So for example, let's say uh, you worked for uh, a TCS, Tata Consulting, right? Back home and, and you're coming to the country and you have a very similar job. We will consider that as previous employment history because you were in the same field, right? Again, uh, uh, down different, but every situation is different. And I can talk about that in absolutely uh, a more personal setting, of course. But there are programs for you if if you're going to put down 5%, 10%, or up to 35%. Okay. Um, very important. And uh, the next slide. Yes. Perfect. So this is where we should all get to. Okay before you actually speak with Lee. So what is a pre-approval? A pre-approval is where we the bank pre-approve a certain amount of a home loan for you. I will take into consideration your income, your income from uh, Canada, your income from back home maybe. I will take into consideration your down payment, your credit. And then I will say your maximum purchase price is 700,000. So now you can go and tell Lee, hey, Lee, Lee you has pre-approved me for 700,000. Then he knows that the limit that, you're, that you can go is up to 700,000. Canada is also a very fast paced. The housing environment, housing market is very busy. So on each home, you're gonna find maybe two or three different offers, okay? Having a pre-approval puts you above everybody. You attaching that piece of paper to your offer means that you have done the first steps, you have already pre-qualified, and if you think about it, the person who is selling the home to you knows you can get a loan and they are more willing to sell that home to you, okay? It's an amazing thing. You should definitely have a pre-approval before making an offer. It's valid. The pre-approval is valid for four months. So 
you have the time <clears throat> to go about and find a home of your choosing. Okay. That's, this is my most favorite slide, having a pre-approval. Absolutely. And in many cases, um, some realtors won't even work with you unless you have a pre-approval because you won't have a sense of what budget you're working with until you've had that conversation, had that pre-approval as well. So it's um, really a, a really important first step uh, when you're starting that home buying journey. Um, so again, highly encourage you uh, to, to use that link we're sharing to connect with a mortgage specialist and start that pre-approval process before you even go to the next steps, which is beginning that search with the help of uh, a realtor likely. Um, but let's talk a little bit about down payments before we get to that. Yes. So tips to save for your down payment. Obviously, save. Don't spend. That's my first thing. That's my first thing. But we can't always control. So uh, saving in a, in a goal oriented way is the way to go. Okay. When you come to the country, we will talk to you a little more about, there are some, a lot of options here where you can talk about a uh, first time home uh, savers account, uh, RSP, like I mentioned to you earlier. Okay. But one of the key things I say is actually two things is if you have debts, or existing debt, pay them down. Because what I really care about is your monthly yeah. payments at the end of the day, okay? Having a lower monthly payment enables me to give you a higher mortgage loan, okay? Second is do not buy a car. <laughs> I say that, I say that jokingly, if you have a car loan or a lease, it does have a, an impact mm -hmm. on your borrowing ability. Because if you think about it, a car loan or a lease, it's let's say $500 a month, okay? Um, that is a $500 of a, a home loan that you could be using. So I always say, if you're planning on buying a home immediately, you know, wait until you buy a good car, you can buy a car for cash, um, up front, then that's fine, but please uh, limit the, the leases and the finances at the very beginning, okay? Yeah, and then one more thing is, so when you come, just let me know, and I could always connect you with one of my banking advisors. I see a lot of questions about limits and, uh, and uh, RSPs. Uh, let me know. I can definitely guide you through them in a lot more uh, personalized setting because these are these are programs that the, that the government has and they can be tailored to you. Um, absolutely. And so I highly encourage you as you are saving for that down payment, if you don't have the down payment available right away when you arrive in Canada, if you're going to be needing to save for a few years to make a plan with your financial advisor to really maximize that savings. And your financial advisor should be able to tell you about the different registered savings accounts that exist that you can um, uh, use to invest and to grow your savings so that you're not just uh, uh, waiting and sitting in an account. They're actually uh, being invested and, and earning uh, interest. Um, and uh, there's there's lots of different uh plans and, and options available within Canada. And obviously someone like Uhiru can help you with the mortgage specifically, but RBC has many other uh, financial advisors, including a team of newcomer financial advisors specifically um, uh, trained to help you as a newcomer set up your finances and understand how they might be different in Canada versus what you're used to and how to navigate that. So highly recommend that um, you uh, if you're going to be saving for a few years before you're in the market to buy a home, do connect with a financial advisor that can help you make a plan for that. There's also options to um, automate your savings. So every time you get your paycheck in, for example, uh, automatically send a given amount of that to a savings account so that you're not tempted to spend it. It makes savings a little bit easier in that way. Lots of things you can do there. So have that conversation to make that plan. Um, Let's talk a little bit apart from the sticker price. 
Oh, we just lost her. All right, let's talk about the sticker price that Clem was talking about. <laughs> so, main, a few other things are at the end of or at, at the beginning of your home buying journey, we should always talk about other costs aside from the purchase price, aside from your down payment. Okay. So, uh, if you're putting down less than 20%, the government will want to will ensure that you pay what's called a default insurance premium. Remember when I said that they're government insured? Okay. Now, when you when your mortgage is default insured, the government will want you to have 1.5%, 1.5% in savings of the purchase price in savings aside from the down payment. Okay. That's for mortgages with less than 20% as your down payment. If your mortgage is 20% or more, then we don't have that requirement, but I still advise you to have about maybe 1% in savings for closing costs, other fees. And what are those closing costs, you ask? It's the legal fees. You need a lawyer to close on homes, of course. A lawyer maybe charge you 1,500, $2,000 for their, for their work. There's also something called a land transfer tax. Let's say, for example, in Ontario, if you're buying a new home, there, the government will charge you a one-time tax. That tax is dependent on your location of your home and the price. So if you're looking for, let's say, you know, $700,000, then you're looking at maybe about uh, $11,000, $10,000 in taxes alone. So it can add up. So we should always be aware of those costs before getting into it or very early on the process. Then you also should have a home inspection once you finalize on a home. You know, I myself is not an expert on what's behind these walls, what's above my roof so much, right? So we have these inspectors to say, the roof will last for another 10 years the insulation is, is, is good, or you may need more of it, right? So those little things are very uh, important for you to know, all right? And there's also maintenance fees that are ongoing. Like, for example, if you have a, a condo or an apartment, there's a monthly maintenance fee, right? So you have to always be uh, aware of those and, and account for those. Of course, there are the things like, uh, repair costs and, and, and other things like furniture you also need, but those are variable costs that are ongoing um, should you need them, of course, obviously you need the furniture, but uh, uh, let's say, for example, repairs, right? You never know. You don't always want to put all of your uh, money into the down payment or the home. You always want to have a little bit of savings for these costs and for your ongoing costs throughout the life of the home. Okay, um, thank you so much for that. I think we've talked about financing extensively. Um, so again, if you've got questions about financing, highly recommend that you connect uh, with a mortgage specialist. Uh, and if you don't have enough for a down payment just yet, make a plan for that because that is going to be your biggest hurdle is making sure that you get to that sizable down payment enough to purchase a home. So um, connect with the specialists we have on hand. These appointments are obviously completely free and they will give you an idea of how to make a game plan for this and, and what budget you're working with. So do use those resources and we'll be sharing these links uh, after this presentation as well. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to you, Lee, a little bit to tell us about what the process is when you're searching for a home, the visiting, um, working with a realtor and the putting in an offer and closing process. And this is really important for everyone to have in mind as they go into this. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, really great information that we've had so far. Now I'm going to get to the nuts and bolts of it. When you're looking for your home, it's super easy to get onto the website on an app and just scroll and look at what average price costs are. I want you to be mindful that what you see is not what you get. A list price is not the sale price. And this is where having a realtor can really be helpful to help you navigate that because you say, oh my gosh, look at this four bedroom house. It's listed for 599. 
that is a strategy that a seller will do. So I want you to be mindful, like, you know, talking when you're looking for your home, have a sense, explore, um, take a look, but don't get set on the prices without speaking to uh, someone who's a professional because they can tell you how um, pricing strategies are and what the best what the real market value is so that's something to be important you you know a lot of people think oh i know everything there's a reason why there are people who are in this role full time to be able to help so one of the things is um try and so select a, a realtor what is the process with behind that we're going to get into that shortly but when you go look for a home uh having a pre-approval gives you a good sense of what you can afford and that will help you figure out what you can actually buy. Is it a condo? Is it a townhouse? Is it a detached house? Right? So, and then we'll get into some of these details, but you know, in Canada, um, well, actually, RBC has a program called, uh, has a website called www.houseful.ca, but we also have something called realtor.ca, which gives you access all across Canada. So there's lots of websites that are out there, but where you can really tap into expertise is talking to a local realtor. So we'll just move on to the next slide here. So this is something that's so important. Who are you going to work with? I always equate it to how did this person make you feel? Do you feel like you're going to get the service? Do you feel you can trust this person? So questions that you really should ask yourself. I, I work in a field where there's over 90,000 realtors. And one of the things to be aware of, not everybody's working full time and people have different experiences and different specialties. So what is the best fit for you? Right. Um, everybody has an uncle, an aunt, a brother, a sister, someone who's in real estate. But what you want to do is ask them questions. Right. Like, hey, are you familiar with this area? Because some you might be looking for a place in like a rural area. You might be looking for a place that's downtown. Very different markets and different expertise. So interview realtors don't be afraid to ask questions because this is going to be the person that will be representing you at an offer table and lahiru mentioned you know there's there's a housing crisis where we don't have enough housing for all the people who want it so competition is high there's high demand for it so who's going to represent you best at that table to be able to negotiate right um and also when you're talking to them how do they make you feel do you feel like you're being heard? Do you feel like your needs are being met? Do they know what you are looking for on a short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategy? So I, there's some questions here that you can ask the realtor. Uh, what kind of experience do they have? How long they've been? What type of sales um, volume? Like if someone does five transactions a year, how does that compare to someone who does 25, 80 transactions a year? Right. So these are things just to be mindful of, because buying a home, whether it's your first home, your second home or third home is usually the largest one of the largest purchases in your life. And you want to have a great team to represent you. Great, great realtor, great mortgage agent, uh, great financial advisor. All of those things matter. Yeah, so, and I would yeah. just add that uh, usually when you work with a realtor, you sign a contract that you're only working with that one realtor. So yeah. before you sign that, make sure that you're comfortable with the person you're getting into a contract with. Absolutely. And in Toronto, in Ontario, we, we've had an update to our legislation, which has made it into two types of, of relationships. So client or self-represented, no how you're being represented, know who's representing and if it's the right fit, right? So these are all details that we can get to um, on a, you know, if we, if we need to, but there's so much information to cover. So I think these are questions that you can review on your own. Uh, and then we'll just move on to the next slide because I think that's what we got to do. Um, buying home. So you've, you found an agent, you've got your mortgage pre-approval, you found a home that you love. Now you have to offer it. What does that look like? I'm going to tell you one thing I have to emphasize in my personal experience you need to have your money ready. Make sure the funds are ready because when you buy an offer and if there's more than one, like people, more than one group that are buyers who are at the table, the strongest people are the people who, who show, here's my deposit. 
usually 5%. Um, here's, here's I, I've come ready. I am prepared to make a deal. That's what I'm here for. No wishy-washiness, right? Because that sometimes trips things up. So when you do it, not only do you sign the offer, but you give a deposit check. And the strongest ones usually have a deposit check prepared on the night of offer, or they have to have it within 24 hours. And I will tell you, being at that table, having your check ready right then makes a big difference. Okay. So this, and then there's also um, with the new regulation that we have under Tressa in Ontario, um, there is something where you can asked to disclose like typically when people would put an offer you you didn't know what anyone else was putting but now there's an opportunity where a seller can choose to disclose who else had what what people have offered at the table so be aware of that um you know and and there's so many details to the transaction and and the offer but this is where it comes back to do you have someone you trust to represent you at the table when you are not there makes a big difference. Okay, next slide. Um, I just want to add in there, Lee did say you need to have the funds available. That means that if you're a newcomer and you're hoping to purchase a home within weeks of arriving, make sure that you transfer those funds for a down payment at into your Canadian bank account right away so that this isn't an issue. Because sometimes international transfers can take a little bit of time. So make sure you get ahead of that. Um, and I, that's so good, Clem. Thank you so much. Because you know what? She's absolutely right. A lot of people are like, oh, we have the money. It's sitting in my bank in Turkey. It's sitting in my bank in India or Hong Kong. But it doesn't count until it comes to Canada. And we have a process called FinTrack. And I, as a realtor, the mortgage agent will have to document where did these funds come. And mortgage lenders, they want to say, hey, these are large sums of money. Where did this money come from? And you know what? There's a timeline. It, you will get the best rate when you have, um, you know, you'll have more options. Like some people have a 30 day minimum. Some people have a 45, 60 day minimum. So do not wait. Don't have it come in dribs and drabs. I know lots of buyers have money in different places. Get that money over. You do not want to risk your transaction failing because the bank says, where did this money come from? I can't count this money. And I have averted a lot of crises, but I have to emphasize Get your money over into a Canadian bank account ASAP, yeah. right, Lahiru? That's and right. And the fact that she's referring to is um, is uh, Canada's way of fighting money laundering. So they do want to make sure that the funds that you're bringing over were obtained uh, in a legitimate uh, way, uh, which is why you may be asked to actually uh, prove that you got these funds legitimately. And it's it's just it's not personal. It's just uh, Canada's way of ensuring that uh, we're we're not um uh giving into money laundering um so let's talk about closing the home purchase now okay so you you're, you transferred your funds right you've got your deposit in all of that stuff great now let's say you said 60 days i'm gonna have to um i'm closing in 60 days once you do that i mean obviously you should already have a real estate lawyer to help you close the deal because they're gonna do searches to make sure the house is clear of any liens and title searches and the other thing too is, I mean, when you're closing, the reason why those funds are important is because your mortgage agent is going to be doing all the paperwork and making sure everything lines up. And so this isn't about doing it the last minute, the day of. Sometimes these processes take five, 10 days beforehand because it's a lot of paperwork, right? So um, title insurance, this is something your lawyer will recommend because it covers you for anything that isn't, um, that might come up unexpectedly. So it's insurance, a good policy. But once once the everything closes, and usually it's, it's uh, between, I want to say, 2 to 4 p.m. Because closing is usually at 6 p.m. If your closing date is, you know, let's say, June 1st, it'll, you'll close on that day before 6 p.m. And so when those keys come, it's an amazing feeling. Um, absolutely. Uh, um, yeah. D did you have anything else you wanted to, to go through? And we, we do, we are on time, so we're good. Okay, cool. Cool. I'm just, I'm mindful of the time. I, I, 
I don't know if there's any questions people have about working with a realtor um, or what it takes to buy a house. It seems really easy, like, hey, I'm just going to look at these houses. But there's so many things behind the scenes that have to be sorted. And this is where, for me, not only is it about me showing you a house, not only is it about getting the offer in, but it's about being able to close the house. And that means having the funds readily available. So all of these factors, getting a pre-approval, knowing what you can afford versus I can, I'm paying rent that's $4,000. I can take a mortgage that's $4,000. It's not always a straight translation, right? Or I'm paying $2,500. I can stretch it. Um, there's almost like a magnifying glass on everything. And it's just so important to line all these details up. And for me, I can't begin to emphasize how important it is to ensure that you're working with someone who will represent your best interest right? Um, and talk you through the situation because sometimes things seem so simple. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, my uncle was going to transfer this money. And then wait a minute, you can't get money from people who are not immediate family. And that's like your parent or, you know, um, not, not like a godparent or <laughs> something like that. Right. But um, it is buying a home is going to be the most amazing thing. And I think that when you're ready, have the right team. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think I'm just going to go back a slide here in terms of uh, here talking about conditional offers uh, okay. that might include a home inspection. Yes. Uh, your realtors, if they're a, a really professional person, should be able to tell you, I suspect that there is a risk that there might be uh, something here that a uh, home inspection would reveal yep. that should affect perhaps the offer you're putting in because it may require renovation Absolutely. or some sort of thing. So um, again, if if you're putting in a condition, your realtor should be able to advise you on that as well. So let's talk about this for a moment because we have a little bit more time. So one of the things is when you buy a home and you put an offer, usually there, there are some three main conditions you would consider putting in. One, financing. Just because you have a pre-approval, it doesn't mean that it's guaranteed because you may have a pre-approval for X amount of dollars, but maybe like you're buying a condo, the maintenance fees might be higher. There could be some, some sort of a lien on the property on the that the condo has. So in a condo, there's something called a status certificate. So when you're purchasing a condo, you will need to see I have a condition on the status certificate if they the seller has not prepared one. The status certificate tells you about the health of the condo condominium board. And these are the people who are running the finances of the condo. Because you own one unit out of many, people pool their money together for what is a maintenance fee. So that's to pay for common expenses, the general areas which people use. There might be a amenities like an exercise room, the garage where you park. And so they always have a bit of a reserve fund to ensure that, oh, if something is broken, they have the money to fix it. But what happens if the condo has to replace all the windows, right? That's a lot of money. So a status certificate is really important because it tells you what their reserve is, how much money they have pooled together over the years, how it is managed, who pays for the management board fees. So you want to look at that because that ties in with the maintenance fee. So some are high, some are low. Sometimes maintenance fees will include all of high, your utility. So it'll include hydro, it'll in include gas, it'll include all those costs. Whereas newer units, typically only cover building insurance, uh, property tax, and, you know, like some of the common elements, but you are responsible to pay for your hydro utility separate. So it's separately meter. So you still have to pay it, but it is under your name. So that's one special thing with condos to be aware of. So with a condo, you could have, everybody always has a financing condition, a status certificate review condition, and also there's a home inspection condition. Now, condos are responsible for sort of all the out, outer areas of a condo, and they're responsible for that, and that's what the status certificate will, will document. Anything in your unit specifically, however, you might want to have someone come and take a look, right? Now, when you're buying a house, a home inspection covers also the outer areas. So, 
it's really and it, it the home inspector you know will be able to say hey i noticed that the roof it probably it has about a 25 year lifespan but it's already 15 years in you have to be prepared for that upcoming expense in three to five years i noticed that your furnace you know furnaces usually go for 20 years this is a newer one it's got about five years but you know you you still have a long time or whoa this furnace is from 1981 and uh, it's past its life but you know you got to be prepared that at any moment <laughs> it could go so these are good um check-ins to see now sometimes if you want to purchase a home a listing agent or the sellers may prepare these documents in advance so that you can review it so when you review it you can make a decision. I don't, I feel comfortable knowing what I'm buying into. I do not need to have this home inspection condition if you, if they've already provided a pre-home inspection, important mm -hmm. um, inspection. Um, also, one thing is if someone has had a pre-home inspection, you as a buyer can also say, you know what, I really appreciated the insight he had. I'd like him or her to walk us through the home inspection and you pay you know a couple hundred dollars maybe to have this inspector walk you through the house so these are details that you should be aware of that are at your fingertips and that you can put a condition to give you peace of mind because you are purchasing probably the most the biggest ticket item in your life so making sure you can get financing making sure that your home there isn't something that isn't seen that you're you know like if you walk around you can see things but what about the things behind the walls like nobody can really guarantee that but an expert might be able to point to signs of you know i was walking by and i noticed that when i opened a segment i saw something i saw some some you know like dampness or i felt some dampness so this might mean there's something else right? Or I was walking the perimeter. And when I take clients out to look, we, before we fall in love with the insides of the house, I always make them look at the outside. I'm like, let's look at the structural piece. Is the house leaning? Houses can lean. And that would be a red flag for me. Um, but you look and you look at the bricks is how's the tuck pointing all of those things, right? So I think these conditions are important to be aware of. There are people who will waive it because they want it so badly, and especially in a multiple offer situation, they're like, nope, I, okay, if I need to, a seller, if you think about a seller, they want to have the confidence of, I've sold my home, I don't have to worry about someone pulling out and having another offer night. A buyer wants to have the confidence that I'm buying a good house or a, a yeah. good home. So this is the dance that we have between buyers and sellers and their agents. And so having a pre-home, uh, having a uh, pre-mortgage approval builds the confidence that, you know what, I know. I, I talked to Lahiru and I know that I, I can confidently buy up to 700000 This place is about six fifty. So, yeah, I feel pretty good. And this is where the intimate conversations happen. And it's usually happening last minute. So being prepared about what that process looks like is super helpful. So thank you, Clem. Um, I was mindful of time, so that's why I, I didn't get too into those details, but it's important. But it's so important. I, I know I have close friends. A, a few years ago, the real estate market was so hot that many people were waiving home inspections just because uh, that would enable them uh, to actually be considered for their bid to even be considered. And I have uh, some friends that uh, put in a bid without a home inspection. They realized after they bought a property that there was a big hole in the basement floor that had been covered by a rug during the actual visit at the home. And then they had not budgeted for that um the, the the renovation works that that would require so definitely having someone on your team that will have an eye out for this sort of uh detail that um in your enthusiasm as a buyer you might overlook uh and then uh, that inspection uh highly recommend that that you do include that um yeah. because it, it's always 
better to not have terrible surprises, very costly ones after the fact. Um, we are coming up on time. I just want to say a few words about once you have closed and you get the keys, the things that you should have in mind as you settle into your new home. You'll obviously need to set up utilities, get the internet set up, electricity, water. Uh, you'll have to update your address with all of the important stakeholders, such as your bank, such as uh, the Canadian Revenue Agency, uh, your employer, all of these things. And then you'll need to furnish your home. Um, and particularly if you're moving into a condo where there's limited space. You'll want to measure what will fit into the moving elevator, what will fit up and down staircases um, in terms of furniture. And, and if you're living in a tight space, buying furniture that has a lot of extra storage space to enable you to fit all of your belongings. Um, and then enjoy, get to know your neighborhood, walk around, uh, find all of the local uh, resources like transit stops, grocery stores, places of worship, uh, the schools where you will register your children, uh, and then join local social media groups groups as well. These are very common in Canada. Um, Facebook groups, for example, for the neighborhood, which is a great place to get to know who your neighbors are, what are the um, uh, activities going on in your neighborhood that you could uh, partake in to, to really start to feel at home. So with that, um, we've gone through a lot today. First of all, the rules around who is even eligible for buying a home either right away or later on. Uh, we've talked about financing um, and planning for that down payment. And then we've talked about the entire process of putting in an offer. I would like to share the contact details for our two co-hosts today. So first of all, we'll be sharing these over email as well. But um, this is the contact detail for Lahiru. If you would like to connect with him specifically, we also have many other RBC mortgage specialists across the country. So if you're looking for someone that is closer to the place that you will be moving to, uh, please uh, do find someone um, that, that may be closer to home. Uh, but uh, you absolutely can contact Lahiru if you have questions for him specifically. Uh, and if you are moving to the GTA and looking to buy a home here, obviously highly recommend that you connect with Lee. She's an amazing realtor. Um, and I can vouch for the fact that she has her client's best interests really takes them to heart and will fight for you. So um, again, if you're moving to a different part of the country, find a realtor um, that will uh, be specialized in the area you're moving to. Um, but do ask all the questions to make sure that you're connecting with the right person before you sign any contracts um, and, and make sure that that person really knows their stuff and is in your corner. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time today. We hope that we've answered as many of your questions as possible. If we haven't, um, please follow up with our two experts after this. Uh, and we really wish you the best of luck in your, your journey to become a homeowner in Canada and really feel at home. So thank you so much for your time today. And um, we look forward to uh, welcoming you to Canada. Thank you, everybody.